Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to Booth Library and the continuation of our series uh, for the Symposium on Ancient Greece. I see some familiar faces here, but I also see some people who have not been to some of our other sessions. So I do want to call your attention to the remaining sessions that are uh, listed in your program. Um, chronologically, so you can find where we are today with Dr. Pudliner and follow that carefully. Um, tonight we have uh, a great program, and Dr. Patterson is with us here this afternoon. You can come back and see him at 7 p.m. with Dr. Mark Cherry. <coughs> and um, then tomorrow there are a couple of presentations, including uh, a film about ancient Greece in the afternoon. And then next week, uh, we will conclude uh, this series on November 7th. So, But there are still opportunities there, and we hope that you'll review these. Um, I know you all work in, uh, and your classes are in areas in which publicity and marketing are quite imperative to the success of your projects, uh, besides good quality public service and good service at the places that you all are studying about and working with. So I encourage you to um, find some ideas here or give me some suggestions as a librarian here how we might make this better for the next time around. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I would like uh, Dr. Wafik Wabi from the School of Technology to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Welcome to this session of the uh, futuristic, futuristic look through ancient lenses. The heart and soul of this symposium is that we look to the future from the present, steady uh, steps using the experiences of the past. And it is enriching and uh, thrilling to look in the past, remote past even, and see how they did things in the past. And uh, for example, the tourism, you think that tourism is very new thing. And last year, uh, Betsy told us that they started with ancient Egyptians. I'm born, I was born in Egypt, didn't know that. <laughs> I know that tourism come to Egypt now, but they, they started doing tourism back then. That was a revelation to me. What about the Greeks? I think you're here today, you know her. I need not to introduce her, Betsy. Okay, thank you, Irene. Um, Thank you for inviting me. I'm Dr. Betsy Fular. I'm in the School of Family Consumer Sciences. My students know me, of course. I teach predominantly tourism and hospitality. Um, and it's really interesting, uh, the past couple of days, unfortunately, we've been hit on the East Coast with Hurricane Sandy. And we're coming to realize now about the infrastructure of our United States, particularly our roads, our bridges, our tunnels. Uh, the underground system um, in New York City is 108 years old. I, did, I, I knew it was over 100 years old. But it has never gone under a refurbishment, a, you know, an updated system since then. Uh, it does have new electronics in. They were able to get in there and, of course, take things out to hopefully prevent what's going on, um, less damage. But I was looking at the infrastructure, and I was commenting on my blog today about this, and it stems a little bit from doing research on here, that our infrastructure for tourism has always been in existence. As long as man has been upright, we have been able to travel, and we have been able to, to go from place to place because of a need, a want, to get from place to place. It, whether it's food, whether it's war, whether it's curiosity, there is a push, a pull, a tug on the self to go from place to place. So, and looking at ancient Greece, and I, I'm starting to compare now what's happening on the East Coast now with ancient Greece because I've been doing some research into travel. And it's really interesting. So first I'm gonna start out with a little bit of history. Then I'm gonna go into the tourism system and the infrastructure. Travel and search for the authentic, which is a little, a little um, debatable now about authenticity. Uh, defining authentic journey, um, looking particularly at Joseph Campbell, and his life work was predominantly on mythology and myths in our, our global environment. And it actually stems back to Herodotus, even Plato, the, the philosophers, of course, of, of Greece, and how they defined a journey, how they told stories. They came particularly from that time period, and how we tell stories today, especially in movies. Um, and Joseph Campbell, that was his life work, and I want to bring in him a little bit um, because it does have things to do with the tourism journey and how we would embark on a, a travel to different countries, different places, even back home. Okay? 
And then I have a few conclusions. Okay, first of all, with history. Um, Greek civilization, um, predominantly from 1500 BC up to 1200 BC, there was a dark period. Before this time with the Mycenaeans, they were really, um, oh, how can I say, they were the, the entrepreneurs. They were the ones that developed a lot of the different systems, money, okay, travel systems, going from place to place, hotels, hostels. Um, in Macedonia, of course, you know, we had the first use of money. But again, the Greeks took all that information. They were pro they, the location of Greece is really a prime area where we can use that area. Everything was coming in to that area, and it was a, a, an area of trade. People wanted to come, and they were going through. They were going through to Egypt. They were going through to France and the uh, European continent. They were going all the way to Spain and to Portugal and to the western part of Africa. Um, but unfortunately, then we have a period, a dark period, where armies are shifting, okay? And they go into a dark period where before the Mycenaeans, when they have this great civilization, all of a sudden it's gone and the infrastructure is gone and they go into a dark period. And we can see that throughout European history, throughout uh, global history, that we have those shifts, those dark periods, okay? All right. Um, Greece is most affected, of course. They were stamped out between 1500 and 1200 B.C. And Homer, who lived um, further on in 800 in the 7th B.C., he bases his poems, his epic poems like Odysseus, on that time period as well as the time period in which he lived. And he talks a lot about travel. We get a lot of historical records from his poem about what happened when they were traveling, about trade, what was going on. And, of course, the Phoenicians then dominate um, until about 900 B.C. And after this time period, Greece evolves into its own up until the first A.D. Okay, so tourism infrastructure. Close your eyes. I want you to close your eyes. Sprawling city on the coast. Marketplace right there at the seacoast. You can smell spices. You can see a colorful food. You can see people haggling on the sea street over wares, over clothing. You can see ships coming into the coastal regions. You can see people coming with carts of food. You can see jars of olive oil. You can see people buying things. You can see people asking for directions. You can see people traveling from one point to the next, walking on carts, on mules. Okay, you can see them being carried. You can see them going to museums, to libraries, to different forms of attractions. Now, is this today? You can open your eyes now. Or is this back in ancient Greece? The infrastructure for tourism in itself has always been in existence. It's everyday life. Okay. We call it travel because we have a purpose. We're going from one point, from destination A to destination B, because we have a purpose. We're motivated to do something. The road itself is not like we have today, even though we do have a lot of potholes. We do have a lot of cracks in the pavement. We see the people outside working on it, especially if you're going up 57. It's always under construction. Okay. Believe me, you guys travel from 57. My students are here. They travel 57 all the time to get back to Chicago. Well, there's always construction. They're narrow in some places, wider in the other. People are in slow in one side. People are fast in the other. Okay. If you go back to Pennsylvania like I do, you have to go over mountains. If you're out in the west, you have to go over steep mountains. Roads may not even be there at all. Okay, it may be a one-lane cart road, okay? Again, how are we going to get there? We can go by ship. We can go by cart, two to four-wheel carts, okay? But most of it, it's good old feet, okay? We could walk from Charleston up to Chicago if we wanted to. There are trails, okay? But most of us travel by carts, <coughs> by mules, and by ship. Ship is predominant. The road itself... Again, it's littered with potholes. It's not paved. Very rarely is it paved. Only when you get into the cities will you see roads that are actually paved. 
and maybe flat. But most of them are ruts carved into the landscape itself so we can push the cart along. Okay. Um, hospitality, there's our rules of hospitality. There's our rules for the road. If you're affluent and you have money, you can stay at the best places. The four star, for, the four star, the four diamonds. You stay with other affluent people. But then there's rules for you to stay there. If you take a gift or are giving gifts, you have to invite that person again back to your own place. And whatever gifts you receive, you have to double that, triple that when they come. My relatives from Germany, when they come to visit, okay, they always are, this is their hospitality, this is their rules of hospitality, they always bring a gift. When I went to visit Germany, when I was living in Scotland, I had to take a gift. I took enough shortbread to fill a suitcase because I had so many relatives. I have to take a gift, okay? It was re expected. Um, again, Homer glorifies this travel in his epic poems. You can actually, if you read Odysseus, if you read the other poems, you can smell it, you can taste it, you can see what happens with the people. This is the literature, and it wasn't just conveyed in a written word. It was, it was conveyed orally to different people. So you can imagine yourself sitting on the steps of a place in the city, down by the, ca the quay, down by the, the coastline, and you're listening to these stories, and you're getting these epic poems, and they're pushing you and tugging you to go somewhere. Um, you, can, you, can, you, you hear it. You can taste it. You can see the other people, and you want to go, wow, is that place really exists? And it pulls you, it tugs you towards that, that different place. So you're restless, okay? So do you have the money to go? And even though you didn't have the money to go, you still went. Everybody travels, everybody uses tourism. Everybody goes from one place to another, even if you don't have the money, because, again, do you want to better yourself? Travel in this time period is opportunity to exchange. Um, whether it's something on a person, something physical, something um, tangible or intangible, you have an opportunity, and travel allows you to do that just like today. There were hostels and inns, not like we have today. I would say like a Hampton Inn. There's a place to put your head in a bed, your butt in a seat, but usually you had to bring in your own food, okay, your own wine, is basically it was just a place to sleep. Now, whether that was in a room or not, or in a room of 20 to 30 people, depends on how much money you have. When you get there, just like today, okay, if you want a prime room, you get there early. All right. But again, it, there's, you know, it's not as it was coordinated. They were the first hostels coming out. They were getting organized, and of course, today we're very organized with our tourism, but it was a place to sleep. Bathhouses, um, they were very communal. You shared it. It was segregated, men and women. Some weren't, but you had to bring your own soap. You had to bring your own towel, usually a servant, or you trusted somebody to watch your clothes because it was known for thievery. People were would steal your clothes, so you had to make sure... You either had a servant with you or you had somebody you could trust. But you bathed with everybody else. You went to the bathroom with everybody else. Okay. So it was one of those things that, and you, it was, you, know, you have basically um, an area where people are communicating, they're learning about others, you're interacting. Um, it's sort of like in Japan today. They still have communal bathrooms. They still have communal baths. Um, there was just a recent article on Yahoo about um, the pod hotels. Okay, you have a place to sleep, but you have a communal bathroom. It's segregated, but you have a communal bathroom, a communal bath, and so forth. You bring your own food. You bring your own drink. Okay. Um, what if you got into trouble? What if you lost money? What if you were down at the local eatery and you got into a fight? I lived in Scotland for six and a half years. I had to know where the consulate was. I had to know where, you know, if I got into trouble, where I could turn to. And they actually did have people in the big cities that represented the city-states. Now, I'm not too good at pronouncing words, 
So I'm going to try. Uh, Proxenos. Hopefully that's correct. Proxenos. Proxenos. Thank you. And they were no, they were basically they represented the city state. And if you got into trouble, you went to that person, that designated person, and they helped you out of trouble. So we still had the consonants of the day, just like we do today. And of course, there's still rules that existed for, of course, um, traveler and the grant of hospitality. Graffiti. Another way of learning about a city, you know, you're walking around, is to watch what's placed up on the walls. What are people carving into the walls? It's been going on for centuries. It's been going on <laughs> since time immortal. Okay, we have decided we like to write, we like to draw, we like to put our stamp on things. I was here. Okay, again, there are a lot of stories. Uh, there's a couple of pillars in Egypt that from Greek travelers, of course, Greek um, at this time period, they were ahead of the game in trade. And they were traveling to Russia, they were traveling to Egypt, they were traveling to up into the, the Celtic states up on the European continent. And they were leaving their mark and they were leaving their stories. Okay, so graffiti has happened since time immortal. I was here. And of course, Herodotus, uh, history, he wrote one of the first history books and he was the first travel writer. He was the first one to chronicle his travel, well, one of the first to chronicle his travels and to talk about why he, why he traveled. He was into comparing religious um, institutions and he wanted to chronicle that. How close were they to the Greeks in religious terms? Okay. So he wanted to basically, he talked to people, he wrote it down, he got stories, he chronicled this, and he put it down for others to read and he brought it back with him. So he's actually considered in tourism one of the first travel writers. So, which is kind of cool. So, travel. Is it authentic? What does authenticity mean? Well, if we go to a definition uh, by Theobald, it's, is it true to form? Is this, what I'm seeing, is this actually something that actually occurs? Is it true? That's authenticity. Or is it contrived? Today, people would um, say Disney World is contrived. I would agree to a certain extent, but as a scientist and as a researcher, I have to look at the good and the bad. I have to be open-minded. Is it chronologically looking at history? Is it portraying history? Is it portraying a story? Is it contrived? Does it have any truth to it? Does it have any fact to it? Or is it just entertainment? Okay, some people would say, you know, there's something there. Um, so authenticity is have I seen something true? Okay. Did it exist back then? Did they put on stories? Did they embellish those stories? Did they give us truth? Okay. And one of the things that was happening there is the start of an exchange of souvenirs. Okay. I wanted to bring back something that shows, yes, this exists. Or I want to do something and honor the gods and put something there that says, yes, this exists. I came here, I saw, I was a witness to it. That's part of authenticity. Okay? I may be bringing it back, I may be a third party and telling a story when I return, but I have seen something that is true. Okay? That is a souvenir. Even though you don't have something physical, tangible to touch, it's something intangible. And we need those stories. Because again, we have other people that are curious. We want to draw meaning from that. So motivation, this gets into motivation. Why do we travel? Why do I want to always go back to Pennsylvania? Why do I always want to go back to Scotland? Okay, what is the thing tugging and pulling at me within myself to travel, to go someplace? And the primary reason back then, of course, was religious religion reasons, but also there was a comparison of societies. We want knowledge, we want meaning, we want to derive meaning from something, we want answers. I want to go to a place because I've heard about this, I've heard about this person, and I want to know if he exists, my heroes. I want to know if Homer exists, I want to know if Plato exists, I want to hear Socrates speak. Okay. I've heard it from someone else who has witnessed it. 
So I'm motivated to go somewhere. I want to hear this for myself. So what's the journey? Well, tourism um, journey is you have this restlessness within yourself. You are in a mundane place. You're, you've been at EIU for so long, for six months, okay, five months, and you get to a point, I'm done with classes, I can't stand it anymore, I have got to get in the car, and I've got to go, okay? Uh, for some people, it's, it's really hard not to ignore those, those voices, that push, that pull, that tug, um, just like it was in ancient times. Why do we want to go? Why are we restless? Why do we want to do something? They're going to look at themselves. Do I have the money? Do I have the time? Do I have the people to watch over my house? Do I have the people to watch over my business? Do I have people to watch over my flocks? Do I have people to do something for me to keep everything in line while I go on this journey? Well, maybe I shouldn't go. But then you talk to your friends. Okay. Hey, I heard about these great games. I want to go see these games. I want to see this person. It was a great time. I'll go with you. Okay? A mentor, your friends, your family, someone that you admire tells you, go. You've got to do this. I'll go with you. They pull and they tug at you. Okay? They tell you a story. They've chronicled their life. You sit around a dinner table. You're enjoying the food and the hospitality of your friends, and they tell you these stories. They paint a picture for you. They chronicle their lives, and they pull, and they tug at you, just like we do today. Okay? And it's multidimensional. It's multifaceted. You get these layers of society, these layers of, of people, of interaction, of community, of family, and you just, okay, I've got to do this. Okay, I can live vicariously through their stories, but at some point, I've got to go. I've got to do something. And it's the storytelling, especially in that time period, that really motivates people to do something. Okay, there's also other motivations. Of course, there's wars. There's things happening in society that is going to push them to do something, to make a decision. Okay, um, economics, natural, physical landscape and also socio-cultural um, basis for motivation. Okay. Again, Homer unfortunately talks about the upper class, of course, because just like um, recently up until 100, 200 years ago, it was just the upper classes that did travel until we had the emergence of the middle class and, of course, in the 19th century. Um, but tourism is based on that written word. How many of you guys get on social media, stop in the tourist office, talk to your friends, and pick up a brochure. You see the reader board, the ride board, and say, oh, we're going to Chicago, we're going to St. Louis. I want to go to St. Louis. I've never been to St. Louis. Okay? You hear people talking in our union. You hear people talking on the steps. You hear people down at the coastline. They've just come from a ship from Egypt. They've just come from Russia and the Black Sea. And they bring all these stories. And you hear them, and it's just like, I've got to do something. Tourism, motivation for tourism is based on the written word. The number one reason why we travel is word of mouth. The number one reason why you pick one hotel over another is word of mouth. Okay. That is why we, you know, we make decisions. We're based on the written word. We want to, we connect with people. We can see ourselves in others. We see ourselves in a philosophy. We see a sense of self, a sense of identity with others. We want to assimilate. We want to expand our own horizons. We want to develop as a human being. And we hear these words, we hear these stories, and we connect with them. We have a connection in our mind, and we want to validate that. We've got to hear it for ourselves. We want to travel. We want to go to the places where the writers we have heard about, we admire and have come to admire. So we want to go. We want to be there. We want to see where they sat. We want to see where people have, okay, this is going to sound strange, people have been murdered. People have gotten married. People have given speeches. People have, you know, partied their heart out. 
We want to do these things. We want to see where things have happened because we have a connection. So we want to go to these places because they are associated with this person, this event, this time period. What's going on? You know, if I'm someone that's trying to get a business off the ground, you know, maybe I want to travel and I want to get to that place because, you know, I'm not making a living here. And I've got to get to a place where I can set up a pub, I can set up a place to eat and drink, or even a hostel, and I can make a, a living, a better living for myself. But the main reason why I do this is I've heard about it. You've got to go. This is where you want to be. So I'm going to travel. We follow in the footsteps. We make pilgrimage uh, from one place to another because they've done it. They have been enlightened. They have taken this information that they have learned along the way and it has broadened her horizons. They've matured. They've become a, a better person. Some people want to travel in the footsteps of the epic poems. Um, one of the um, ones that I, I love to read and I can't, I have a slide on it, but along the way, oh, Oedipus, okay, he murders his father on his journey, okay? We want to walk in those footsteps of that journey of his life because we see something, we understand something from that. We want to walk in Lincoln's footsteps here through central Illinois to Springfield all the way to Washington, D.C. because of who Lincoln was. We want to understand the man better. We want to understand his reasoning why did he do this? Okay, It's another motivational factor. So again, the journey is just not about ourselves, but it's about understanding the meaning of life. It's understanding why we do something. But again, along the way, people realize this, that we have to support these people. We have to create inns. We have to create bathhouses. We have to have places where they can buy food. We have to have the roads. We have to have the political system and the government to allow travel. We also have to have peace. And I want to bring that in because during this time period, there was actually a, a movement within um, during the Olympic Games. Of course, we have the first Olympic Games. Okay. And our physical landscape in Egypt, or in Egypt, excuse me, in Greece, of course, lends for a lot of sports. And we are physically moved by our landscapes. We are, we are shaped by our landscapes. And during this time period, um, we get to the Olympics. Hold on, I'm going to go ahead a little bit really quick here. Uh, the Olympic Games, the ancient Olympics. And we, a lot of people travel from all over Greece to get to these games. They've heard about them. They heard about the sports. They heard about their heroes. And they get there, and they're physically transformed. Okay. By attending them, can you imagine yourself? Okay, you guys are you guys are in comfy chairs. Imagine, you know, everybody pushed in. How many of you guys have been to the United Center and you're all sitting there like, you know, sardines in a can? Okay. That's what it was in the Olympic arena. And you but it, you're there and you're enjoying the excitement. You're in you're you know, you're watching the runners, you're watching what's going on, the heavy athletics and everything. But it is a reason because there is, you know, within yourselves, you want to do homage to these people. You want to do homage to your lifestyle. And one of the reasons with the political um, activism here is they had, during this game, they basically wrote a law that says no wars were allowed to happen, which is, of course, today's also. Unfortunately, it does happen. But during the Olympic Games, there was not supposed to be any war. Everybody was supposed to put aside all their differences, they're supposed to have peace during that time period. Okay? Unfortunately, it doesn't happen in today's society, but again, in ancient Greece, there was actual laws on the books that said, nope, no wars. We put aside our differences, we come together as a peaceful nation to celebrate. Okay. Let me go back here just a bit. Okay. Again, I told you about Oedipus and that motivation for travel. We want to walk in his footsteps. We want to understand his life. Why did he make this decision? How was he transformed by the landscape? Okay, again, we hear these stories. It's called personality tourism in today's society. Um, how many of you want to go see the Michael Jordan statue up at the United Center? How many of you want to stand there and take 
a picture with Michael Jordan. How many want to travel to Washington, D.C. to the mall and stand in front of the Lincoln Memorial, go up and read the words of Lincoln, and you want to get your picture taken there? Okay. It's called personality tourism. And it's still in existence. It's existence. It's been ever since we've had admirers, we've had heroes, we've had people that, you know, we feel we had, you know, we can assimilate with, we admire a great deal. We've always traveled to see these people. We want our picture taken. We want to, you know, I always want, instead of a picture, I always want to shake somebody's hand and meet these people. That's enough for me. And I can say I've met these people. Okay? It's called personality tourism. It's been in existence since ancient times. And actually, we preserve the sites for that. One of the things you can assimilate this with is all the different shrines and so-called churches to the gods. Okay? We have something for Poseidon. If you're coming into port, the first thing you do, you get off at port, is you go to the shrine of Poseidon, and you thank him for the safe journey over water. You burn incense. You give him a um, tithes, an offering, to tell him thank you for the journey, to help other sailors on their journey. That's one of the first things you do. If you're traveling by road, you stop at the shrines of Hermes, because Hermes was one of the Greek gods that protected travelers overland. Again, you offer sacrifices, you burn incense, you give him offerings to tell him thank you. We still do it today. If you walk through Scotland and you see along the road a mound of stones, just like you did in ancient Greece, you see a mound of stone, it's called a cairn. And you're supposed to stop and you're supposed to lay a rock on top of that cairn and, and say a little prayer for safe travel. It actually is coming from ancient times because that's, if you didn't have a shrine there, you're supposed to stop and place a rock on top of a mound of rocks and worship Hermes. Okay? That is one of the things for a pilgrimage, to get you from one point to another safely. <laughs> and again, the Olympic Games. Again, from the Olympic Games, we have all these different myths coming out. We have all these different stories that come down today. It was the first Michael Jordans, the first, oh God, I'm going to try to get some sports figures here. I'm going to go um, Bradshaw and Lynn Swan from my time period for the Steelers. Okay, I'm, you guys probably wouldn't know that, you know, the youngsters. Um, but, you know, um, I'm talking football players, uh, Bobby Clark from the Flyers, um, Boston Celtics and all that. We had our myths. We had those people that we admired. And it accumulated into an oral tradition. Again, why we travel, why we go from place to place, is again, we're reinforcing those stories. And those stories still exist today. You can still read Homer. You can still read the major classical works. And we understand ourselves, like we were saying. We have to, un to understand today and to understand how we can better ourselves and better society is. We have to look at today. We have to look at the past in order to understand the future, in order to make the future better. And why we have those oral traditions, why we have these oral stories, is a chronological history of how we have existed. And it's important. But there is, of course, a method to the madness of how to tell a story. If you're sitting in a pub, and I love, last time I was in Scotland, I was at my favorite pub called the Babity Bowser, and the physics department from the University of Strathclyde was in, having their class in the pub. And they were talking about quantum physics. And they were talking and they were telling a story because that was the best way the teacher could basically convey the information. And he was talking about Einstein. He was talking about the great physicists of the early 19th century and 20th century. And he was telling them a story. And he was conveying it in that how he had met Einstein in the United States and all these other things. And I was just sitting there and listening, and I, and I got a sense of a greaterness um, about the world from his stories. And I actually learned a lot about quantum physics that day. But there's a method. You've got to give a little backstory. You've got to, you know, set the stage. Okay? You've got to just not just go into the main premise, but you've got to give them information. You've got to set the stage. You've got to then go into and tell them the little differences about, you know, what's going on. Why did they do what they do? Why did they crush that threshold into a different reality? Why did they go from point A to point B? What happened along that route? 
what happened along their travels to, you know, to test them, to challenge them. Um, what happened, you know, on the way back? I have this one saying that I always say, um, and I, I haven't told my class yet, but, you know, sometimes the, the roads um, coming back are even harder than the roads going out because you've learned something. You've been transformed. And that's one of the things that Campbell came back with is how are we transformed by this journey? How are we transformed when we travel from one place to another? And, you know, you know it's not only an outward journey but an inward journey of discovery. And it's also you can see this in plays in, you know, um, when you, the Greeks put on their plays and everything, there was a method and a madness to putting on that play. Music was important, but the music had to fit in with the story. Okay? People weren't just coming to be entertained. They wanted to learn something. It basically brings the place to life. It, it brings the place, it gives it more depth, it gives it more meaning, it gives it more layers. And so we do have a journey, and this is a synopsis of uh, Joseph Campbell's hero journey. Um, we're restless in our ordinary world. We hear the call to adventure. We might refuse that adventure, okay, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's, you know, something we have to do that's more important. We have the right to refuse it, okay, or we have the right to accept it. And sometimes that is meeting the mentor, meeting someone else, and telling them, look, you need to do this. Even if you only go for a couple days, even if you only go for overnight, you still need to do this. And so then we cross that threshold, and we go from our ordinary world into a special world. Even if we've been there many times before, even if we've traveled and gone from this place many times, there's something about this place that I can find something different every time. Every time I go from here to back to Pennsylvania, I find something new, even though I grew up in Pennsylvania and we traveled a, a great deal around Pennsylvania, there is still something new, something I, I hadn't noticed when I was a child. And a couple um, summers ago when I was traveling back and I was going Route 70 and I was going Route 30 back through Ligonier and I'd rolled down my window and I'd pass Sleepy Hollow Lodge and everything. And I got there, all of a sudden I smelled garlic in the air and cedar. And I hadn't really ever noticed this as a kid. And we used to travel this road a lot from Ligonier back to Johnstown. And I'm like going, wow, where have I smelled this combination before? And there's something else there that I can never put my finger on. But I've smelled it in Williamsburg. I've smelled it in Jamestown. I've smelled it in the old places that are associated with the Revolutionary War. And I, can't, I know it's a plant, but I can never put, I think it's holly, but I can never put my finger on it. But all of a sudden, I got that smell, and all these memories bubbled up, and everything that's going on, and I've crossed this threshold again, even though it's familiar, I'm realizing, I'm recalling these memories, and it's an inward journey. I'm reliving things. Um, when I went to Scotland for the first time, um, I was going to go on my own. Of course, my mentor, my father is my mentor said, you're not going on yourself. You're not going. I was 30 years old, and he says, no, you're not going by yourself. I said, I'm fine, Dad. I'm 30 years old. I can do this. Okay? I was going from, you know, grew up in a town as small as Charleston, and I'm going to the big city, going to a different country. I'm going across the pond. You're not going by yourself. You're a woman. You should never go by yourself. Okay? Dad's very traditionalist. Okay? I said, no, Dad, I got this. I got to do it. Nope. So, of course, he packed up, you know, my sister, my mom, and my, my dad and I went, and we crossed. And it was a whole new, different environment. And I learned so much. Uh, even though it's an English-speaking country, and it was like coming into my own backyard, I still learned a great deal. I got to meet different people. And I got to learn about the culture. And so I met friends, and I met allies, and I was tested especially with my sister sitting beside me on a bus. Think of Oedipus traveling along on that road, and his father is basically dressed as a peasant, and he doesn't know who his father is. It's, he doesn't know that it is his father, and he kills him. You're Tessa. I almost killed my sister on that. Believe me, I almost killed my sister on that tour bus. Okay? I knew at that time period I was never going to be on a tour bus again. Okay? I'm just not for a tour bus. My sister really challenged my patience that summer. But think of Oedipus. He's traveling along. He's, you know, he's going from one place to another. 
and he meets his father. He doesn't know it's his father, and he, and he kills his father. Okay? So again, we're tested. We're challenged. We, um, what if we're going to a different place that has a different language, different money system? Okay? We have to approach an inner cave. Okay? We have to make the decision, oh, my God, what am I going to do? What if you lose your money? What if you lose your passport? What if you lose your papers back then? You cannot, you, you cannot replace that, not like we can today. Back then with money, you took it with you, and it, you took chests of it if you were going someplace. You took bags of it, unless you were poor and you were going to beg your way through life. Um, what do you do with it if you have so much or you, you know, what are you going to do with it? Can you carry it for one? You're going to get to a point where you can't carry it anymore. And that happened a lot. And what they did was they basically, and there was hardly any banks back then. There was a concept of banks and lenders um, of the Jewish persuasion um, still at that time period. Um, but not like we have today where, you know, you go from New York, you go to Chicago, you can take your money out really easily. Um, but it wasn't. Basically, you left your money. If you couldn't take it anymore, you had stuff that you couldn't travel, you left it. You left it with the church. You left it with um, at a shrine. You donated it to people. Okay. So again, you're challenged. You have an ordeal, and you have to face it. And of course, you're rewarded because you understand what's going on now. You, you have a greater awareness. You're going from a limited awareness to a greater awareness even more so back then because they're not as the boundaries of life in t today's age is not as you know blurred as they are back then we really didn't know about people unless you did travel you didn't really know about society unless you did travel you didn't know what was going on around you like we can we can read in the newspaper we can pop yahoo up on the internet and we can read about what's going on in New York. We can read about what's going on in Greece with their economic, you know, the strain of their economics right now. We can read about what's going on with the euro. We can read about England, you know, wanting to get out of the European Union. But back then, you really were encapsulated in this area, and you really didn't know what was going on unless you did travel, okay? Unless you talked to people. Unless you got out of your ordinary world and you traveled. But when you do travel, you're rewarded with this information. You're rewarded with this greater awareness of what's going on around you. And, of course, you have to travel from point A to point B, and you have to go home again. Okay? And sometimes the road back home is harder than the road going out. And, you know, other people want to hear what happened. Other people want to hear about your travel journey. Other people want to hear about what you learned. Okay? So that's the reward you bring back. You return with this elixir, and you talk to people. And this is what happened um, in the epic poems and the philosophers. They brought it back and they exchanged it with other people. They talked to people. And you're reborn. So again, we're actually, by travel in ancient times, we are transformed. Greece became a very prominent, very powerful state because of trade, because of travel. It went from something in obscurity to an actually a very powerful government system. And not only just powerful in government, but power in knowledge and education. Okay? Because people traveled, because they had, they were, they were located in a prime area, um, surrounded by a lot of water, trade routes. They were in Egypt, they went to Russia, um, even further than Moscow, even up to the Black Sea, and around up onto the European Peninsula. So they were transformed, they became more powerful. Um, again, we um, can accept or refuse that. We can cross that threshold. That's a little bit more about it. We are changed by that environment. We are changed by our enemies. We are changed by our friends. And we're brought in. We can explore that world. And our perception, our state of mind is transformed. Um, I do feel, and this is just my humble opinion, that we are better off because of the Greeks and because they travel, because they trade, because of their system of government. We were allowed to develop and see from their experiences and their uh, establishment of their state, you know, military-wise, education-wise, intelligent-wise, because of what they did. We were allowed to expand our own intelligence. And I really feel that we, you know, by them traveling at that time period and expanding their horizons, we are better off today. Um, and we, they told us. They just didn't let it go. They told us. They wrote it down. 
they, they pass it on orally. They pass it on, you know, story to story. That was one of the things that they gave us that was really important. And because of travel, and travel actually takes back like a second seat. It is that action that's important, but it's more about what they brought back with them, what they gave us. And that's what I really think is important. And their self and identity, their sense of self and identity is very strong. I have a lot of good friends that are from Greece. And I, every time I meet them, every time I talk to them, I am just amazed. And I am transformed by having them as friends. So in getting to the conclusion, places do affect us. Places transform us. Uh, Greece is one of those places I still have yet to, it's on my bucket list. I still have yet to visit. I want to visit. I would like to live there if possible. Um, I am motivated to travel because not only of this research, but because of the fact of food development. It was at the crossroads of a lot of things that were happening in terms of food and food development, of trade and economics. Um, it's one of those places for the scenery. I am transformed by the scenery myself, just like anyone else. It becomes a supporting character in and of itself, and I really want to travel to someplace like that that can transform me from the visual as well as the other sensations. And I want to interact with the people. I want to meet people just like the ancients did. I want to interact with them. I want to get to know them. I want to be transformed by them. I want to have a level of maturity because of them. So I really think a land and people, that interaction with travel, we're better off with it. Okay, so I want to leave you with some Byron. And Byron loved Greece. He's actually uh, carved uh, a few of his initials, graffiti-wise, into a lot of the different um, plazas, a lot of different stones around Greece. Um, and I want to leave you with, but words are things and a small drop of ink. Falling like dew upon a thought produces that which makes thousands, perhaps millions, think. And Byron's one of my favorite um, poets. And he was re he, he loved Greece um, as much as I love Scotland. And of course, I would love Greece as much when I get there, hopefully, on my bucket list. So again, travel makes you think. Travel makes you really think and open yourself up to that thought process. So any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. You're and welcome. Before the questions, sign up for my study abroad course 2015, God willing, I'm putting together a study abroad course called 21st Century Ancient Greece. Ooh. So sign up for this if you like. Stay tuned. Okay. If you graduate, yeah. if you graduate, email me, okay? <laughs> it will be 21 days and one. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> and we will cover everything you can dream about. We start in the morning at 5.30 in the morning and finish at 11 o'clock in the night, at evening. So we'll cover everything. And Greece doesn't start till about 10 o'clock at night. As I understand from my friends from Greece, things don't start happening until about 8 or 9 o'clock at night. So okay. th this is a free time for you, okay? No. So <laughs> the program there. Of course, those are coming from hospitality students too, so. Excellent. Now, um, do I see anything here with you? Yes, you do. I want to make sure that we... Uh, thank Dr. Todd Leiner for her participation in this and exploring the touristic side and um, hospitality side of ancient Greece. So we give her a certificate from very good. The series. Thank, you. thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for coming. You're welcome. Now, if you have any questions, I know you will meet her, your students. Yes, these are all like, my students. If you like to have any question that you can share with us uh, on the camera, that would be great. I have one question, if I may. Sure. Uh, you touched something very quick, but if you can elaborate for two seconds on it. Two seconds on. That's fine. When you said in tourism, we have internal tourism or something, mm -hmm. but we go and see things, but this reflects pebble or ripple effect inside us. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that? Um, tourism is either an outward journey or an inward journey of discovery. And two seconds, it's not enough for me. You guys know that. <laughs> two seconds is not enough for me. Um, it is that portion where we can reflect. Um, some places, um, Living in the, don't, don't take this the wrong way, people. Living in the middle of nowhere, you may not be aware of what's going on. And for us to get to a point, a next level of a maturity, we may have to travel. We may have to step out of our ordinary world 
to realize who we are as ourselves. So we develop a level of self-confidence, of self-reliance, of self, basically a sense of self, that next form of our sense of self. And okay. travel and tourism allows that, you know, because we are awakened to other things that are going on. I try to put a graphic thing to your idea, so you correct me in this. Uh, if we have an object here, mm -hmm. and here we are, if you make lines like this, you can have uh, one foot here that comes inside and create another world inside us. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, kind of, it's like, sort of like the armchair traveler. Um, we can sit at a computer, and you know we're on the computer. I don't know how many hours a day, and we have this inkling. You know, we're on Facebook or something, and we have that little ads on the side. And we we've, we've told someone on our friends list, oh man, I would love to go to see the autumn leaves in New England. And of course, the next click you make, you'll see all those ads come up now for New England because you've mentioned it. And some people who have, do not have the ability to travel or are very challenged in their travel, be able to get out and travel. They rely on, we, which we have a great thing now, is we have a connection that we don't, you know, the ancients didn't have. But we have the ability to go to places and be a part of those places. Um, Google itself, now has put so many, they're starting to um, document and digitize a lot of the museums, a lot of things around the museums. I was just looking around the other day, and so there's a Greek project that now is going around and doing 360 panorama of all the different um, places around Athens and putting them up online. So if you can't get to Greece, you can actually go see these places and sit, stand there and do a 360 degree panoramic of like the Parthenon and stuff. And for some people that can't travel, this might be the only way they can travel, but then they have to create, they have to read, they go to the library or it's delivered to them electronically and they can read about these places. I was trying to find this one, it's called The Ladder in um, Peleopinus, I can't think of the name, I know it starts with a P, but it's called The Ladder. It was one of the um, pilgrims' trails that they went from one place to another. It's in um, Delphi. And I, and I know it exists. They say it still exists today, but I was looking for a picture. Because I don't know about you guys, but when I read stories and everything, I actually see visuals in my head of the characters. I see them traveling along this road. And I try to you know, find that picture on the internet and put myself in that place. And I'm actually transformed by doing that search, that journey, that inward search. Even though it's a little bit of you know, pushing the mouse around, I'm still transformed. I see something now, and I can associate that that place with these people. I can look up and I can see, you know, the Parthenon. And I can say, "Wow, what's going on?" And some other places in Greece and everything that I've never been to. And I can see, you know, what did it look like at that time period? There's reconstructions on the internet, and I can get a sense of that place. So that's that's an inward journey. You can sit it. You can sit in an armchair in front of your computer nowadays. And you can get that sense of place, and you can transform yourself through words, through the oral traditions, through the storytelling. Three things. If you can afford it and stay for the next session, we have a great speaker, Dr. Alan Barlow. Those of you who know him would love to hear what he has to say about that. Those who don't know him and can stay, please stay and know that. It's the first thing. And at 7 o'clock, we have another interesting uh, topic, not in this room, but in Wither's room uh, in the fourth floor, if you can afford to do this, Dr. Patterson will do that, uh, and uh, I'm sure it will be great. Uh, they say one thing. Th second thing is, uh, may your thought tourism never ends. How about that? Just to end on a poeti po poetic one. So I hope that our thoughts never rests, just always go in journey from glory to glory. Mm -hmm. Third, please give a round of applause to our speaker. All of a sudden it's gone, and the infrastructure is gone, and they go into a dark period. And we can see that throughout European history, throughout uh, global history, that we have those shifts, those dark periods, okay? All right. Um, Greece is most effective, of course. They were stamped out between 1500 and 1200 BC, 
And Homer, who lived um, further on in 800 in the 7th BC, he bases his poems, his epic poems like Odysseus, on that time period as well as the time period in which he lived. And he talks a lot about travel. We get a lot of historical records from his poem about what happened when they were traveling, about trade, what was going on. And of course, the Phoenicians then dominate um, until about 900 BC. And after this time period, Greece evolves into its own up until the first AD. OK, so tourism infrastructure. Close your eyes. I want you to close your eyes. Sprawling city on the coast. Marketplace right there at the seacoast. You can smell spices. You can see a colorful food. You can see people haggling on the sea street over wares, over clothing. You can see ships coming into the coastal regions. You can see people coming with carts of food. You can see jars of olive oil. You can see people buying things. You can see people asking for directions. You can see people traveling from one point to the next. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to Booth Library and the continuation of our series uh, for the Symposium on Ancient Greece. I see some familiar faces here, but I also see some people who have not been to some of our other sessions. So I do want to call your attention to the remaining sessions that are uh, listed in your program um, chronologically, so you can find where we are today with Dr. Pudliner and follow that carefully. Um, tonight we have uh, a great program and Dr. Patterson is with us here this afternoon. You can come back and see him at 7 p.m. with Dr. Mark Cherry. <coughs> and um, then tomorrow there are a couple of presentations including uh, a film about ancient Greece in the afternoon. And then next week uh, we will conclude uh, the series on November 7th. So, But there are still opportunities there and we hope that you'll review these. Um, I know you all work in uh, and your classes are in areas in which publicity and marketing are quite imperative to the success of your projects, uh, besides good quality public service and good service at the places that you all are studying about and working with. So I encourage you to um, find some ideas here or give me some suggestions as a librarian. Um, in New York City, is 108 years old. I, did, I, I knew it was over 100 years old. But it has never gone under a refurbishment, a, you know, an updated system since then. Uh, it does have new electronics in. They were able to get in there and, of course, take things out to hopefully prevent what's going on, um, less damage. But I was looking at the infrastructure, and I was commenting on my blog today about this, and it stems a little bit from doing research on here, that our infrastructure for tourism has always been in existence. As long as man has been upright, we have been able to travel and we have been able to, to go from place to place because of a need, a want to get from place to place. It, whether it's food, whether it's war, whether it's curiosity, there is a push, a pull, a tug on the self to go from place to place. So, and looking at ancient Greece, and I, I'm starting to compare now what's happening on the East Coast now with ancient Greece because I've been doing some research into travel. And it's really interesting. So first I'm going to start out with a little bit of history. Then I'm going to go into the tourism system and the infrastructure. Travel and search for the authentic, which is a little, a little um, debatable now about authenticity. Uh, defining authentic journey, um, looking particularly at Joseph Campbell. And his life work was predominantly on mythology and myths in our, our global environment. And it actually stems back to Herodotus, even Plato, the, the philosophers, of course, of, of Greece, and how they defined a journey, how they told stories. They came particularly from that time period, and how we tell stories today, especially in movies. Um, and Joseph Campbell, that was his life work, and I want to bring in him a little bit, um, because it does have things to do with the tourism journey, and how we would embark on a, a travel to different countries, different places, even back home. Okay. 
And then I have a few conclusions. Okay, first of all with history. Um, Greek civilization, um, predominantly from 1500 BC up to 1200 BC, there was a dark period. Before this time with the Mycenaeans, they were really, um, oh, how can I say, it? they were the, the entrepreneurs. They were the ones that developed a lot of the different systems, money, okay, travel systems going from place to place, hotels, hostels. Um, in Macedonia, of course, you know, we had the first use of money. But again, the Greeks took all that information. They were pro they, the location of Greece is really a prime area where we can use that area. Everything was coming in to that area, and it was a, a, an area of trade. People wanted to come, and they were going through. They were going through to Egypt. They were going through to France and the uh, European continent. They were going all the way to Spain and to Portugal and to the western part of Africa. Um, but unfortunately, then we have a period, a dark period, where armies are shifting, okay? And they go into a dark period where before the Mycenaeans, when they have this great civilization, all here, how we might make this better for the next time around. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I would like uh, Dr. Wafik Wabi from the School of Technology to introduce our speaker. Welcome to this session of the uh, futuristic, futuristic look through ancient lenses. The heart and soul of this symposium is that we look to the future from the present, steady uh, steps using the experiences of the past. And it is enriching and uh, thrilling to look in the past, remote past even, and see how they did things in the past. And uh, for example, the tourism, you think that tourism is very new thing. And last year, uh, Betsy told us that they started with ancient Egyptians. I'm born, I was born in Egypt, didn't know that. <laughs> I know that tourism come to Egypt now, but th th they started doing tourism back then. That was a revelation to me. What about the Greeks? I think you will hear today, you know her. I will need not to introduce her, Betsy. Okay, thank you, Irene. Um, Thank you for inviting me. I'm Dr. Betsy Fulaar. I'm in the School of Family Consumer Sciences. My students know me, of course. I teach predominantly tourism and hospitality. Um, and it's really interesting, uh, the past couple of days, unfortunately, we've been hit on the East Coast with Hurricane Sandy. And we're coming to realize now about the infrastructure of our United States, particularly our roads, our bridges, our tunnels. Uh, the underground system, 